Because uh, I had just thought, you know, maybe after our little time together, there might have been a few oh, up in the air thoughts that we might want to just chew around a little bit, see if it would bring any, uh, what, what would I call it, any light to your exploration. Give you guys anything more to play with. Well, Sensei, I, I, I have a question. Um, uh, Gareth Abdenor here. Phil uh, graciously let me take one of the classes after we got back. And I found it was relatively easy to find that centered place myself. But as soon as I started trying to communicate that to the students, my head got involved and I had to constantly try and refine my center. I was wondering if you had any advice or suggestions on how to stop the brain getting involved when teaching. The, the funny thing is, you know, the way this stuff is like, kind of almost counterintuitive sometimes in that, you know, you have to do both at the, not do neither, but both at the same time or something. And um, I think the most important thing that you can teach is noticing when you feel like you've lost that connection and showing the students what you do once you see that you've lost it and helping them carve a path, a training, a, a technique, if you will, of getting back to center, of recognizing it and getting back, recognizing it and getting back. Not that once you learn Aikido like I am, you'll be centered like I am. Right. Um, no, you'll be just as fucked up as you <laughs> always were. A little bit quicker at recognizing it and a little bit quicker at getting back to a place where you feel more at home with yourself. And I think the misunderstanding is that you're supposed to show the students that you're doing it, meaning that you haven't lost it or that, you know, you've got it. And really what you want to be teaching them is that you're getting it back again every second, just like you're oxygenating your bloodstream right now, almost in a secondary process to this breathing and this. So I'd come back to, uh, you know, what you've got all on your own is listening to the breath. As monotonous as it sounds, um, coming back to that, paying attention to how you're oxygenating your system. But as much as you can, um, you know, have one of the students come up and, uh, kind of, and, you know, lift on your arm and then have you kind of weight it down a little bit. And, and whatever it is that you do when you make that one little shift, yep. or, uh, if I imagine, I'm going to come up back here a little bit, yeah. Uh, so if, if I'm asking Kenneth here to lift up on my arm, right, yep. and I do my downward extension. Um, now, we didn't do a lot of work with imaginary ukes, but we, we usually do. Uh, and so if you could just, while you're sitting there right now, imagine someone has your, you know, two hands on your arm down here and there, somebody on each side of your chair is trying to lift you up out of your chair right now. And how that kind of activates the way you get back into your body again. You just keep imagining it. Now it's better if nothing matches somebody really doing it for some reason. It gets more graphic. We feel it more, we respond to it better. But even in the imaginary uke phase, you can feel yourself re-inhabiting your body, if those words work. Yep. And um, that, um, 
breathing, that reconnecting, that allowing the inner penetration of spirit into your life, uh, or key, or energy, or feeling, or presence, or change. Just staying in that process, and then, you know, the thing I think we know is that it's going to get to be head trip. That's why we use ukes. That's why we don't do one of the other arts. And, you know, we're still trying to set it up in a cooperative developmental way. And um, I think people confuse because it's a martial art that we're doing that. But, but uh, still, it's this physical presence or call centering or grounding. And I particularly have been liking the couple of guys on each arm. And it usually just takes a minute. And uh, I can feel, you know, I'm starting to I'm coming back to it. Um, what would seem considerably harder. So I don't know if that helps at all. But it does. Doing, doing it out loud in front of the students, getting someone to help uh, show the difference, help you um, demonstrate the difference between the two places when you're. Well, I think you know that there are times when somebody will lift you fairly easily, and times when they practically can't do it. So, what's the difference? What are we looking for there? How would you all talk about that distinction? And I'm saying, yeah, that I think that learning how to talk about this shift in a way that we can quote unquote, teach it, we can pass it on, and we can make it part of the practice of the art. Um, well, from my experience to this actual um, question, or whatever you like to call it, um, has been that um, the development of it has been a, um, like trying to create pictures in your mind and then following that path until it ceases to become pictures in your mind and then it becomes a feeling in your body mm. and from then on um, it's a lot easier to switch to body than it is to get your mind to switch over so if you can actually just switch into how things feel rather than how thing how you see things then um, you seem to be able to be, get centered a lot quicker and stay there a lot longer because it's a feeling rather than a thought. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think when we um, we can trace the techniques back into the feeling a bit because they're all designed on non-resistance. They're all they all go with some kind of flow around back into. But it's flowing, it's a blending, it's an attitude of harmony. And so the techniques do develop that. But I had a friend who studied in France who said, um, there in France they do it through technique, you know, we use the technique to find our bodies. You know, here in your dojo where we do this freestyle Tiawaza practice, we, we use our bodies to find the technique. And I, I like the, <clears throat> the sense of, Feeling gives birth to the movement, but you just have to de-emphasize the throw and make the blend all important. Once they start blending the techniques, and then I say, if you put enough monkeys on enough mats, they reproduce all the techniques of ideas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think staying with feeling, coming back to feeling, uh, you know, recognizing that that's really the order of the day. what we can show our students that we are doing. We find some, something like we've gotten to a place where it's different now. It's exactly the same practice that they're doing. Hopefully, we're just you know, having a little less of a gripe session with ourselves about it and we can go more directly into, you know, becoming one with the universe. 
Sensei, I, I, I don't want to dominate the, the questions, but I do have a follow-on from that. Um, when, when you're working with uh, beginners um, and you're doing Giawaza, you're, you're concentrating on centering and on the feeling of the blend um, and, and definitely try not to get bogged down in, in technique and wrist twisting. I'm just not sure that, does the technique become totally unimportant for the beginners? I mean, those of us who've been doing it for a while, we, we at least have the basic technique so that we can forget about it. But with the beginners, if do they just get the technique by osmosis? And if they don't, does it really matter? Do, do you have anything to say on that? Well, get it up. I think the, the, the question, again, brings us down to that. The question that showed up with, um, there was, all of you, was uh, you know, about this getting um, results oriented. And I was saying, well, there's nothing wrong with that. The problem isn't that your results oriented, but it's that you uh, haven't quite delineated the exact results that you want. Because if you did, you would calculate your actions more appropriately. And, and the thing that's most important is um, the presence. So let's see if we can get uh, this on your screen a little bit again. Uh, which, which, yeah, okay. Um, so if, if I don't have a certain amount of power, if I'm too weak or, or too fixed, if I don't have that basic key, then it really doesn't matter if I've got a technique because if I don't have presence to handle it, yeah. uh, the technique's worthless. And then at this point, if I can get a sense of how to work in harmony with someone else's action, if I can get, as opposed to this direct opposition, this ability to somehow, I know you can't quite see it on the screen here, but, but to somehow change the direction of the quality of the, the interaction um, and start to get that feeling of blending with their energy. And uh, there'll be a tendency to kind of pull out. If you can kind of keep them engaged in that and make that the goal, make um, the presence and the blending the goal. And uh, it will blow all of your minds. We remember for the one we did with our eyes closed with two attackers at one point. Yeah. How, how good everybody was at that point. Yeah. We, we had tuned into that state or something. I think you, you're, you'll be surprised at how quickly and how easily everyone's body understands this. Uh, but if you don't have that basic floating bridge, if you don't have that basic semi immovable, kind of feeling, substantial or, you know, uh, it's hard to find a right word for that one, yeah. Uh, but, where you you know, you have a groundedness that makes it very much your choice as to when you move and how. Uh, that's kind of power, working internally with another person's power. The techniques will start to show up. I can't tell you how many times um, been in that position and especially with beginners and it's like you just bring them back to centering and, and flowing and blending and the, they're already finished the technique before you even <laughs> but, but when I say how important is the technique I'd say not not too important in the beginning not not too important um, because if they hang out for a while they'll have seen Nikyo and Kota Gaishi enough times and, and if you get it, it just turns this way. Yeah. Which is Kodagaishi or Shihonage. Yeah. You know, 
Uh, or it turns this way, which is Nikyo or Nikyo or Sangyo. It's just an extension of the same spirals. So it, it, you know, it turns, the thumb turns towards the body, the thumb turns away from the body. It's, uh, you know, that moving in, moving out as your receptive is their positive, blah, blah, blah. So it does the fancy, but, but the fundamentals are pretty simple. And once they get that, um, so like I say, every technique should be coking all game. Once you really get that feeling of blending happening for your students, They'll find the techniques and your ability to be able to teach them the techniques will seem to kind of just grow exponentially all of a sudden. Once they're in feeling, oh, you can show them this stuff. But when they're trying to learn it from what Phil was saying exactly from their heads, uh, we need every cheap trick in the book to get them back in. And to me, the, the push pull, just are you there or aren't you there? Can you, you know, handle the pressure? Are you still fluid? Now, can you blend? Uh, yeah, I'd say by the time they've hung them long enough to get those two at any decent level, they'll have learned half a dozen of the techniques, and that's basically what there are. I eight of them, eight fundamental directions that we're going to talk about. Um, and again, it depends on, you know, like I say, I, I live in West Marin, so the fighting side of the art didn't really seem that important to my students. I don't think most of them were really there for that. But if I had taught, you know, in a rougher neighborhood, uh, my focus would have been different. And so I think it's to each teacher, each individual student that you work with, that's always got to be the case. But, uh, um, yeah, I wouldn't worry about the techniques because uh, by the time they've hung in long enough, I have done them enough times that, you know, I can. Thank you. Good morning, Richard. Um, you know, it's common for you guys to do a practice that you did. You did a ask. Thank you, guys. Um, as opposed to working, you know, just um, fundamental techniques, you know, and stuff like that. Um, it's a little spooky as a teacher because you're completely out of control. You can't tell them what to do. You can't. You know, correct them because, you know, all you can give them is a little push or pull and see if they're <coughs> grounding a little more or help them get a little bit more. Uh, you can have them attack you and you can show them a flow or a blending feeling uh, as opposed to forcing or fighting. And then, uh, and then it's about Sam. The, the strange thing is when you when you're training in in Jiawaza, it, it seems to remove so much of that expectation damage um, because it doesn't matter if you're doing the right technique or not. You're just looking for that feeling. At least that's how I experience it. No, I think that the feeling gives birth to the movement because of the feeling. Uh, because you're in that feeling, the right movement will occur. And, and you know, there's nothing they can do about it either. It either turns this way or it turns this way. It's kind of binary. It's just, it's, you know, mm. do that. It's going to move in or it's going to move out, you know. Yeah. It's just going to be pretty, pretty fundamental. And once you're disconnected in that, in those eight powers, uh, it really doesn't matter which way they move. It doesn't, you know, none of it. None of it is, is particularly a problem for you. Uh, but again, it's like this funny place because, because like water, uh, you want your movements to be that natural, the way water moves. Uh, it doesn't ask itself questions about what it's doing. It just does. It fills the space in whatever shape it 
it takes, and there's never any resistance. And just that spirit of being present with what's going on. And again, I think the, I think I told you guys this when the, one of my students said to me, I couldn't figure out what you were doing, and then I realized you weren't really deep, just learning out loud. And, uh, and I think that that's the best service we can offer them in the sense that, um, I, you know, I, I may have missed it, but I, I, my feeling was we were hanging out together. None of us really had some dream of holding the pole out there with five guys on the, you know, uh, just wondered, you know, what that must be like or something. So I'd say, you know, none of us kind of represented at the level that he did, what, whatever he was doing. I, you know, I kind of want to be careful to say that what I'm doing has anything to do with it in a way. Uh, but it's, it's the way that I'm exploring what I understand that he left us. Uh, it's a way to, because here's the other thing about do the techniques really matter? Well, if you're attacked, then maybe they do. Although I'm always surprised by how, like the whole story of a kid in three months put a gun away in a robbery and a square here with a Kodagaishi, you know, so you never know. Uh, but for most of us, I don't think that's where the change in our world is going to come about. Uh, it really is going to come from developing the spirit of working in harmony with each other on an overpopulated planet. Uh, because we're bound to get more frustrated with each other. And so these skills could make our journey a lot more pleasant if we understood them the right way. And, uh, and my, you know, my feeling is that it, uh, you'd like your martial skills to be effective. Why wouldn't you? You know, uh, but I'm not sure that they're what most of us are here for or not. I think I said, you know, that on one end of the spectrum, there are people that's all they care about. On the other end, they don't care about the martial skills at all. And, and they probably say funny things about each other. But the question for me is, what is it that helps you get more real? What is it that helps you accomplish your bestowed mission? What is it helps you be true to yourself and contribute to your community, a true yourself, a true, you know, who you are, in a way that's not combative and not in opposition, but in a harmonious way, you're able to bring forth the fact that, you know, you don't agree with what everybody sees, or you think it might, you might consider something different. And just having the courage and the strength to be able to bring that in, because it probably is a stupid idea, but you never know. Can you hear me, Richard? Yes. Hey, um, after the Gesku, we sort of, training for me has changed quite a lot. It sort of brought me back to why I studied Aikido in the first place. And it's difficult to find that feeling and that connection still in the dojo. So it's when things have shifted. Have you got videos up on the net or anything like that of when you're talking about the invisible UK or some of the more the grounding techniques that I can have a play with and just a bit of an experiment with myself? Yeah, we don't really have the you know invisible UK practices. Not on media, that's a good that's a good call. But, but you know what? It, it looks as weird as you're thinking. <laughs> Uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, then we'll do a comment today. Just go with it. You'll, you'll, you'll uh, but make sure they're good who can, is the thing. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing that, that, um, I kind of want to encourage you all to play with, and that, that's why I thought that if, if some of you actually heard what I said, uh, that it would be disturbing to your Aikido, uh, in the sense that it's like it's coming from such a different place as to how to make this experience unfold that it could 
could make you, know, you wonder, you know, but it's like I, I um, you know, take your hat off in a church, put your hat on in a synagogue. Uh, is one of them right or wrong? Uh, it's, at this point, it's kind of convention, it's style, it's whatever. And um, and I, I don't think it matters too much uh, if someone's into doing technique tonight. Uh, but when you do technique, do technique with as much feeling, you know, just as very uniquely blended with the individual uke at that moment in time as you possibly can. Just make it your practice to be in that state. I mean, you got to understand when I started there, there wasn't anyone doing what I do. And so I had to find ways to do it inside of the training uh, of the other schools. And uh, I'd say that was certainly a big part of my art. The other part of it was I would just take people out, you know, on the grass somewhere, we would just play together uh, because then there was no pressure of any kind, so to speak. And uh, I guess I'd, I'd kind of come back and say, you know, play with the imaginary new case, play with somebody pushing your head from behind and, and then trying to imagine being there so they can't and lifting you up and, uh, you know, Basically, I think, you know, those are the, uh, the practices. Um, but when you've got somebody around, uh, you know, have a, you know, have them come over and, uh, you know, just lift on your arm, just lift it up a little bit and just practice your, whatever you're doing there, you know, whatever. So, um, it's, it's important that you create your own practices. Um, uh, just, just on a personal note, um, over the years that I've been going to Bob's seminars and and uh, also yours, Richard's, um, I found in the early days, um, every time I went to one of those seminars and we then went back to the dojo, my keto turned to absolute rubbish. And it took varying times, especially in, uh, earlier in the in the piece. I remember one year, I spent a whole year trying to do rubbish Aikido, what I thought was rubbish anyway. And it took many, many years to actually let go what I've learnt and then take it back on board at a later stage when I was ready for it. Um, so as far as... Um, was that Mr. Fraser? I think it was there. I was talking about how he was feeling in the dojo uh, after leaving the Gashiku. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. It all comes back and uh, it actually comes back bigger and better. But um, that's just a personal experience on uh, attending these particular seminars and then struggling with it afterwards. Yeah. yeah the, we had actually talked about this on our little test call the other night. Um, the, you know, actually, one of my friends said pretty good. He said, when we started about six months in, I started to go, oh, I, I think I'm getting what this stuff is. And then he says, as far as I can tell, it happens every six months. <laughs> and uh, and I, I think in a way, we, you know, we've got to hope for that. The purpose of today's training is to defeat Yesterday's understanding. Today, yesterday's technique. Today's technique. But there's something about the fact that how we know ourselves is changing. How we are giving value to the whole experience of being human uh, is growing and, and changing. It's it's. Um, uh, so that was something we'd actually talked about before because we, we thought that you guys would all be, may or may not have someone else around uh, to work with. So it's something we uh, actually use even in a class full of, you know, uh, other Aikido. Um, just take it, an invisible uke, an imaginary uke, and um, go through the technique. I, I like to do it with a really good uke 
um, so that, um, you know, I can look really good. Um, some people get, you know, more painful Luke's. It's, it's a personal choice. Thing. But uh, it's, a great, it's a great tool. Um, good place to start sometimes. We were talking about staying the same. We were talking about having somebody lift up on your hand here and doing your whatever, whatever we want to call it, grounding, practicing, and then doing that with imaginary UKs when you didn't have any, you know, just sitting at your desk or something to do for a minute. It's not as good, but it's better than nothing. And, you know, considering the amount of time you can get imaginary UKs compared to the other things, so there's a good value. Uh, do you well, for, for a while now, I'll be doing a lot of imaginary Aikido and I have a lot, but lots of imaginary UKs because <laughs> I'm stuffed. <laughs> I can't walk. Yeah, no, I actually, I, um, I like to do my, particularly my sword work with imaginary sword partners. And slow motion practice. Can't emphasize that enough. And especially for your beginners, and any of you who saw me saw how pathetically hopeless it is trying to get people to go slow. You just can't do it. But try it. Anyway. Hello. No, just um, just trying to explore the feeling. Really, it's the feeling sitting there. It's difficult to try and translate that. When I'm working with um, other people who have a different feeling, a different understanding, but I'm just persisting with it, looking for ways of, of doing it, really. And funnily enough, my practicing Aikido is sort of probably more off the mat than on the mat, just to help sort of, I suppose, find that feeling again. As I, we talked about, there's been a shift inside myself, and I still am uh, learning who that new person is in some ways. So just trying to go with that. Sounds good to me. I actually quite enjoyed just listening to everybody else's point of views. Yeah, absolutely. I would, uh, I would like to say I haven't been uh, particularly vocal uh, in today's meeting, but I've actually really enjoyed it, and there's, there's real value here for me. So uh, despite the fact that I haven't contributed, it's, it's, it's something I'd very much like to be part of in the future. It's been very interesting. Thank you. Um, just particularly from my point of view, being a beginner, yeah, um, it just gives me a different approach, really. Yeah. Well, I, if you guys can help each other with the imaginary UKs, once you get a good imaginary UK, they're pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming and spending some time together.